What happened in Pope County has stunned Arkansas and has rocked the nation. A mass murder of almost unbelievable proportions, 16 dead, including 14 who may be members of the same family. Over the course of one week in 1987, Ronald Gene Simmons shot, strangled, and beat to death 14 of his family members and two former co-workers in Russellville, Arkansas, in what was the most horrifying act of domestic violence ever recorded in America. But not many people have heard about the case. It's a long, dark story of one man's iron-fisted control, abuse, and incest, spiraling into paranoia and isolation, and finally, murder. Let's get into it. Hi folks, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Delaney and I'm a true crime writer and major murder nerd. On this channel, I like to take deep dives into the worst cases and I do tend to cuss a lot. So if that sounds like your idea of a good time, go ahead and subscribe. If not, that's cool, you know you. So for this episode, I wanna go into one of the worst murder cases, not just in my home state of Arkansas, but in the country, that of Ronald Gene Simmons. Ronald Gene Simmons was born July 15, 1940, in Chicago, the second of three children born to Loretta and William Simmons. His father died when he was three, and his mother remarried and had another son, as well as a set of premature twins who died shortly after birth. Gene started showing narcissistic, controlling tendencies early on. His younger brother would describe him as a bully and a tyrant. He would hit his younger siblings, lie, and manipulate them and his parents to get his way. If he was ever told no or called out on his lies, he would erupt into fits of rage and would never back down or admit he was wrong. In 1946, when Gene was in second grade, his stepfather, who was in the Army Corps of Engineers, was transferred to Little Rock. But instead of moving his family to the big city, he settled down in the small town of Hector over an hour's drive away. There, they lived in an old farmhouse without running water, 20 miles away from the nearest paved road, surrounded by the Ozark St. Francis National Forest. Jean loved it there. He called it paradise. For the rest of his life, he dreamed of returning to Arkansas and living the simple life. When he turned 17, he joined the Navy, where he met Rebecca Uliberry, who went by Becky, at a USO dance hall. Becky was just the kind of woman Jean wanted. Meek, accommodating, and dependent. She had never even learned how to drive. They had a whirlwind romance, and Jean would write to her almost every day while he was away on duty. They got married in 1960 and had their first child, Jean Jr., who they called Little Jean, the following year. Over the next 17 years, the couple would have six more children. Jean, of course, didn't believe in using birth control, since having babies was, in his mind, what women were for. Still the same bully and tyrant as always, Jean ran the household with an iron fist, even when he was away. He had set schedules for meals, laundry, and cleaning, which Becky was required to follow. He controlled all the finances, forbidding Becky to work and paying the bills himself. He would only allow Becky a small, quote, allowance, as he put it, which usually wasn't even enough to cover decent meals for his family. But Becky would only express her frustration with his tyrannical ways in her diary, and even then she would tell herself that he probably knew best. Unbeknownst to her, though, they weren't actually that poor. Jean was just stingy as fuck. After finishing his stint with the Navy, he got a job at a bank, which paid pretty well. But his know-it-all attitude and controlling personality pissed off his co-workers and supervisors, so he was never offered any promotions. So he went back to the military, this time to the Air Force. And this was in 1967 and 68 during the Vietnam War, or police action. But Gene got to spend his tour of duty behind a desk, working in the Office of Special Investigations in Saigon, conducting internal investigations into the black market trade and commissary goods. His obsession for order and control was actually an asset in the OSI, and by all accounts, he excelled at his job. While he was at the OSI civilian headquarters, he lived in a pretty cushy life. He had maid service, a cook, and laundry delivered to his door. He had officers, commissary privileges, and whenever he had any R&R, &R, he would spend it on the beach in Australia. Meanwhile, back home, Becky and their three small children were living in a tiny travel trailer on her parents' property. 
Jean continued to control all their finances from Saigon, sending Becky only $40 a month to support the children with. For perspective, that's less than $370 in today money. After he returned stateside, he moved the family to San Francisco, then to Cloudcroft, New Mexico. It was there in New Mexico where he began pursuing his dream of having an off-grid farm. But he couldn't be bothered to actually do any of the work. Instead, he had his kids working long hours building rock walls, putting up fences, and whatever other jobs he wanted done. From the time they got home from school until late at night. In the summer, he would work them from sunup to sundown. He also kept them isolated. He would not allow a telephone in the house and rarely allowed the kids to have friends or any kind of company over. He had the only key to the mailbox and would read all the incoming and outgoing mail. So while his family was living in isolation and poverty, remember, off-grid means no electricity or running water, he bought himself a motorcycle and a pickup truck. He was spending money on himself that he didn't have, but he was covering for it by taking out loans from relatives and banks. So far, so bad. Until the birth of his youngest child, Rebecca Lynn, in 1977. Becky had by now given birth to seven children, and all of them had been underweight. Her obstetrician had diagnosed her with an underlying health issue and recommended in strong terms that she get a tubal ligation, stating that another pregnancy would put her life in danger. But, this being 1977, her husband also had to consent to the procedure. And, of course, Jean did not consent. Becky pleaded with him, literally begging for her life, until finally he begrudgingly relented. But after that, he was never the same. He never forgave her for putting her own life and her children's well-being over his desires, and essentially just stopped having sex with her after that. In his mind, she was of no use to him anymore. And that's also around the same time that he began turning his attention toward his oldest daughter, Sheila Marie. From the time she was born in October of 1963, it was clear that Sheila was his favorite. While his other kids had to beg for money, for school supplies and lunches, Jean lavished Sheila with gifts of clothes and jewelry. For his other kids, he had only criticism, demands, and insults. But Sheila was his little princess, his ladybug. I think you know where we're going with this. When Sheila was only 15, Jean began molesting her. In March of 1981, Jean dropped Sheila off at her prom, then gathered the rest of the family and told them the big news. Sheila was pregnant. And while he didn't outright say who the father was, Becky knew. Jean laid down the law, as usual, and commanded the family to simply accept the child and raise it as one of their own. Becky fell into a deep depression, but didn't say or do anything. Even though Jean had ordered his family not to tell anyone about this, somehow the word got out. And eventually the word got all the way to the Otero County Office of Social Services. When questioned, Sheila admitted that Jean was the father of her child. But instead of arresting his ass, social services just ordered the Simmons family to undergo family counseling. At his counseling sessions, Jean, of course, showed no shame or remorse. He claimed he'd done it for Sheila's own good in order to protect and teach her. He saw nothing wrong with what he'd done and basically dismissed the counselor's questions. But he wasn't completely naive to how the rest of the world saw what he'd done. Jean knew that the New Mexico district attorney took a hard line on child abuse and might be bringing the hammer down on him. So soon after Sheila gave birth to the baby, who she named Sylvia Gale, Jean uprooted the family again and fled to the place that he loved the most, Arkansas. First, they settled in Ward, Arkansas. There, he got Sheila pregnant again, but this time, despite his loudly proclaimed pro-life belief, because of course, he obtained a secret abortion for her. Once Sheila turned 18, she started taking classes at a business school in Little Rock. At first, Jean encouraged her, but once she met a guy and started dating him, Jean was determined to shut that shit down. To his way of thinking, Sheila belonged to him. So he moved his family further away, to a 14-acre spread in Dover, which he named Mockingbird Hill. There, they lived in a jury rig structure made up of an old trailer house with a bunch of weird half-ass additions. 
As usual, there was no phone, and the only indoor plumbing went to the shower. Water for cleaning and cooking was caught in jugs and buckets that they lined up along the roof's drip line. The thrown-together outhouse, which was built uphill from the pond, would overflow in the rain, and because gravity works, the sewage would run into the pond. Check out the big brain on bread! Like in New Mexico, Jean had grandiose dreams of turning this literal shithole into a self-sufficient off-grid homestead. And also like in New Mexico, he put his kids to work to make his fantasies real. He started piling up salvaged materials for his various projects, things like cinder blocks, pallets, sheets of tin, car parts, you know, shit like that. His house just started looking like a hoarder's house. But Gene didn't have the kind of resources he'd had in New Mexico. Because he'd just up and left his previous job without notice, he couldn't get another cushy civil service job, and he was deeply in debt. Instead, he ended up taking various low-paying McJobs, which he couldn't even hold down. One of his better jobs was as a clerk at a law firm in the nearby city of Russellville. But there, he started hitting on a co-worker named Kathy Kendrick. When he wouldn't back off, she went to their supervisor, and Gene was fired. Back at home, Gene was losing control. His older kids started moving out, some of them before they even turned 18. Then Sheila eventually moved out and married the man she'd been dating, a man named Dennis McNulty, over Jean's loud protest. Sheila had told Dennis who Sylvia Gale's father was, and Dennis had been kind and accepting about it and promised to legally adopt little Sylvia. Jean was not taking any of this well. He started physically abusing Becky. He bought himself another gun, a six-shot Ruger twenty two. Then, on December 18, 1987, Gene quit his part-time job at the Sinclair Mini Mart in Russellville. Ever the calculating, detail-oriented control freak, Gene had a plan, and he would need some time to play it out. Gene had invited his older kids who had moved out to come back to visit for the holidays and bring their families with them. Little Gene, who had brought his three-year-old daughter Barbara with him, was the first to arrive. Early the morning of December 22nd, the younger kids, 17-year-old Loretta, 15-year-old Eddie, 10-year-old Marianne, and 8-year-old Becky, left for school. Once they were gone, Jean went into little Jean's room and began beating him with a metal pipe. When that didn't kill him right away, he shot him several times with that Ruger. In another bedroom, Becky was cradling little Barbara, protecting her and pleading with Jean for their lives. Gene shot Becky, then strangled Barbara with a fish stringer. He loaded all three bodies into a wheelbarrow and dumped them into a large pit the children had dug several months earlier, then doused them all in kerosene. He then went back into the house and waited, passing the hours watching TV and drinking. When Loretta, Eddie, Marianne, and Rebecca came home from school, he greeted them in the yard, smiling and promising them each a surprise. He had them wait in the car and listen to Christmas carols, well, one by one, he took them inside and garroted them, holding their heads underwater in a rain barrel to make sure they were dead. He took them out to the same pit as the others and covered them with dirt and barbed wire, then put some scrap tin over it to keep out scavengers. The older children, Billy and Sheila, along with their new families, were expected to arrive the day after Christmas. So again, Gene waited, drinking and watching TV by himself. Four days later, Billy, his wife Renata, and their infant son Trey arrived. As soon as they were inside the house, Jean shot Billy and Renata, then laid their bodies by the dining room table and covered them with their own coats and some blankets. He strangled little Trey like he had the other children, then wrapped him in plastic and placed his little body inside the trunk of a junked-out car behind the house. Next to arrive were Sheila and Dennis, along with Sylvia Gale, who was now seven, and Sheila and Dennis's biological child, 21-month-old Michael. Just like with Billy's family, Jean shot Sheila and Dennis and strangled the children. Sheila's and Dennis's bodies were laid in the dining room and covered with jackets like the others. Michael's body was wrapped in plastic and placed in the trunk of yet another car on the property. Sheila, however, was given special treatment in death, just like she had in life. Her body was laid out on the dining room table and covered with a tablecloth. Later that day, Gene drove into Russellville, where he stopped at a store and bizarrely picked up some pre-ordered Christmas gifts. That night, he went to a bar and had a few drinks. Then he went home and waited out the weekend, watching TV and drinking beer while the corpses of his family rotted in the next room. 
On the morning of December 28th, the first workday after Christmas, Gene drove back into Russellville, walked into the law office where he'd been fired, and shot and killed Kathy Kendrick. Next, he went to another previous employer, the Taylor Oil Company, where he shot and killed a man named J.D. Chafin. He also shot the owner, Rusty Taylor, but thankfully only wounded him. He then drove to the Sinclair Mini Mart, shooting and wounding two more people. After that, he went to the office of the Woodline Motor Freight Company, where he shot and wounded yet another woman. Then, he just sat down in the office and chatted with one of the secretaries while he waited for the police. When they arrived, he handed over his gun and surrendered without any resistance. Ronald Gene Simmons was charged with a total of 16 counts of murder, including the largest family slaughter in U.S. history. After his arrest, he underwent a psychiatric evaluation where he was found fit to stand trial. He actually had two trials, first for the murder of Kendrick and Chafin, then a second one for the murders of his family. At his first trial, he was found guilty on May 12, 1988, and was sentenced to death. Then, at his sentencing hearing, he made his statement under oath. I, Ronald Gene Simmons Sr., want it to be known that it is my wish and my desire that absolutely no action by anybody be taken to appeal or in any way change this sentence. It is further respectfully requested that this sentence be carried out expeditiously. Next, he went on trial for the 14 members of his family. During the trial, prosecuting attorney John Bynum submitted into evidence a note that was discovered in a safe deposit box after Gene's arrest. The letter was from Gene to Sheila, where he confessed his deep love for her, but it also seemed to indicate that he was still angry with her for telling Dennis who had fathered Sylvia. When the judge ruled the letter admissible as evidence, Gene lashed out at Bynum, punching him in the face, and then tried to go for the deputy's handgun. Officers were able to get him down and rush him out of the courtroom in chains. He was again found guilty and sentenced to death by lethal injection, plus 147 years. He refused all his appeals and even fought in court for the right to do so. And on May 31, 1990, Arkansas's then-governor Bill Clinton signed his execution warrant. On June 25, 1990, he died by lethal injection. This was the quickest sentence to execution time in U.S. history since the death penalty had been reinstated in 1976. Since no one would claim his body, he was buried in the prison's cemetery in Varner, Arkansas. Ronald Gene Simmons was what is known as a family annihilator, a murderer who either in one fell swoop or over the course of days murders most or all of their family. You might have heard of other infamous family annihilators like Chris Watts or John List. They're the type that usually makes the headlines. A man who outwardly has all the trappings of a perfect family, like a devoted wife, a high-status job, and clean, well-behaved children. They usually have no history of abuse and no prior criminal record. These type usually get set off by some traumatic event that they believe will ruin them. But that was not at all what Ronald Gene Simmons was. He was the more common type of family annihilator, a sociopathic domestic abuser who was threatened by losing control. And if you or someone you know is experiencing domestic violence, call 1-800-799-7233 or text LOVEIS to 22522 or go to www.thehotline.org. Before I end this one, I want to give a big shout out to the book where I got most of this information, Zero at the Bone by Bryce Marshall and Paul Williams. I'll put a link in the description if you want to check it out. If you're still with me, thank you so much for sticking it out till the end. I really appreciate it. If you liked this kind of deep dive, please give this video a big thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel. You can also support me through memberships or on Patreon. The link is down below. Till next time, darklings. Thank you.